If you have a Bible this morning, we're going to be focusing on, no surprise, if you were here uh, in the last few minutes, Colossians chapter 2. So if you have a Bible or a smartphone with an app, let's go for that. And uh, we'll read it here. Actually, let's read it. Uh, I'm going to start just the first few verses of chapter 2. You know, we last week looked at chapter 1. Now we're going to build on that and look at chapter 2. So just let me read starting in verse 1. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you, this is Paul, and for those at Laodicea, and for all those who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, he was not with them, that's why he's writing the letter to them, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. And now we're coming to the two verses that are central to this morning. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, Continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. We're going to go to the first part of verse 10. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. I just want to pray this morning as we uh, get set, just to look at these two specific verses, but be encouraged by what's around it. Father, would you just um, take our hearts and allow them to be pointed towards you with a full attention to what you want to share with us by your Spirit. I pray that as you speak to our hearts, that we'll not only hear it, that will build upon it and that will act upon it according to your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this week I was reading a story about uh, Christine Sinclair, and some of you may know who that is and some of you don't. Um, I don't know her personally, of course, but Christine Sinclair for many years now has been a part of the national uh, soccer team in Canada, and she has just put it out that she's going to retire from the team. After, I think, maybe 23 or 24 years of being on that squad and going out. And over the course of that time, I think, if I'm not mistaken, she's been in six World Cups. I think they even won gold in one of those. I think that she's been, oh, sorry, they, they didn't win the World Cup, but they won the Olympic gold, I think. Am I right? Just most recently, I think. So she's been in four Olympics. And she has scored 190 international goals. Like 190, which is more than, I think, anybody on the planet, if I'm not wrong. In history of women's sports, and maybe even men's, I'm not even sure, but certainly in women's soccer, am I, am I right to this point? In both men and women? So the point is, she's had a prolific career. She's had an excellent career in the sport of soccer. And what I found interesting, although, I, again, I don't know her, I, I'm not a soccer player necessarily, or someone that follows fluidly football, but I, I would say that what's neat about reading about Christine Sinclair in just the few days after her making this announcement is just how impressed people were with not only who she was as a person, who she was as a teammate, but also as a player. And she scored these 190 goals. It said, I mean, one of the coaches, previous coaches, I think, was speaking about Uh, how impressed they were that she wasn't flashy. She just did the right things right. She just kept working hard on the skill and knew what it took to score. And she contributed the way that she could. So, So there it is. She was a person of respect. She was a teammate who worked and prepared hard. And she went out on the field and she got it done. And so it is that I think, not that I'm looking for any of us to emulate Uh, Christine Sinclair from a a spiritual standpoint. I don't know where she stands spiritually. But I would say that that work ethic is such that not only 
as even we've been talking about this morning, not only was it impressive about her personal character, her teammate characteristics, her play ability, but then she has, I think, changed the scope of the game for young men, sorry, young, well, probably young even men and women across this nation for the sport. She's been an ambassador for the sport. And I think that Paul, in a very different sense, although parallel perhaps, is trying to say, I have a bit of a word like this for you. How would it be that in the end of your term or career, as you retire, wouldn't you like someone to be able to say of you, the character of your per person, the character of you as a teammate, and the character of you as an actual player? You didn't just talk about it. You didn't just go to practice. You went on the field and you got it done. It didn't have to be flashy, it could be very simply in the way you did that, but it was a way that was memorable, admired, noted. So Paul is, up to this point, just encouraging the church in Colossae. Now remember, it's not him who started the church, but it was through his influence that the church was started. And now he's writing a word of encouragement to them. And this, verses 6 and 7, is the first time he ever gives them an instruction. What has he been doing up to this point? He's been laying the groundwork for them, not only to be a believer, but a believer not just on their own, but a teammate. And not only just a teammate, but someone that who gets on the field and gets things done. In a way, as an ambassador for the game, the whole context for Christianity changes in the region that they're living in. And he says this, up to this point, what has he been doing? He's been laying the groundwork for who is Christ. Who is Christ? He's been trying to say it every which way. And I last week shared with you, and I want to add one word to it this week, my definition that I wrote in my Bible just before the service. I said, Jesus is our eternal creator, sustainer, purpose and prize who is worthy of all our praise. Do you remember me saying that? Well, I want to add one word because it's very important. Jesus is our eternal savior, creator and sustainer, purpose and prize. And throughout the chapter one, we hear from Paul, in, especially in verses 16 and 17, that, that Christ created all things, that in Christ all things were created by him and for him. There was an understanding that he existed from creation on and that he sustains all things. He gives us this purpose to go. And now in verses 6 and 7, he's given them the instruction. And I want to just read those two verses again, although we've heard it in another context already this morning. So then, just as you have received Christ. Now, how have we received Christ at this point? We've received Christ in faith, in truth. In love, we've understood who Christ is. He's been declaring over and over and over who Christ is for them to understand. So then, just as you have been, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. Now, I don't want to go too far past this before understanding that we talk about Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. We talk about him as prophet, priest, and king. He is the word from the Lord, like he is our he is a spokesperson for the Lord. He hears from the Lord, he is the Lord. And he speaks to the people in his day, and he speaks to us by his spirit. He is a prophet. He is a priest. He speaks not only for the Lord, but he intercedes for the people. Right? And so Christ did on the cross. He interceded for us as that priest. He made a sacrifice for us on the cross. And then he is our king. He is the eternal reigner, overseer, matchless in his in his height of who he is and what he oversees and so he says just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord he is your Messiah he is your Savior and he is your Lord every single day so just as you've understood Christ properly as Christ, as Jesus, as Lord, as prophet, as priest, as king. Continue to live your lives in him. Continue to live your lives in him. This is an important phrase. What does it mean to live in Christ? It means to be rooted in him, built up in him, strengthened in your faith 
as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. To live in Christ is how we are to live. There was a prayer that he gave in Colossians chapter 1. He was preparing them for this. He wanted them to be filled with the knowledge of God's will by way of spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they might live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. He prayed for power and endurance and patience. He, lived, he prayed that they would joyfully give thanks for the knowledge of who Christ is and what he had done. In essence, in the next few verses, in verses 12 through 14, the, the summary would be, he was praying that they would be rooted in Christ's redemption, that they would be built up in the knowledge and wisdom and understanding of who Christ is and what he has done, and they would live a life worthy of the Lord, that they would live in Christ. In essence, as we learned last week, in Christ's image, that we would be the representation of here on earth of Christ, that he would be so in us and we so in him that people would look at us and they would see and feel and experience Christ. We never take his place, but we are the image of him. Like an image is never the original. But sometimes, if you've ever seen, if you've gone to a, a wax museum or you've gone to something where something was imaged, sometimes the image can be pretty close to the real thing. And all we're saying is that what we, pe what we experience and what we express in Christ, that we are Christ's image in the world. That's what he's asking us to do. And so as we are his image, as we, as it says in Galatians chapter 5, as we walk by the Spirit, as we are led by the Spirit, as we display the fruit of the Spirit, as we live by the Spirit and keep step with the Spirit, in essence he's saying we're walking and being led and displaying fruit and living by and keeping in step with Christ. We are in Christ. That's how we become the image of Christ. And so this is the, the idea of not only a status with Christ, but also this relationship, this healthy relationship with Christ. So whether you're dating right now or whether you're married right now, the fact is, especially for those of you who are married, the day you got married, you entered into a relationship to a new level. So you started going on a date. That was one level of the relationship. And then you got married. That was a whole different relationship that when you entered into that relationship, everything changed in your life. Right? Nothing has been the same since because it's not just all about you anymore. In that relationship, you are now walking differently. You have a new outlook on life. And he says, I want you to see that we now have a new relationship. That's what a Christian has. They are rooted in him. Christ has made a difference in us. We now see him differently. We call him our Christ, Jesus, and Lord. We call him our prophet, priest, and king. We are now in a whole new relationship with Christ. And as we talked about it this morning, talking about those roots going down into the ground and what makes it so that tree doesn't fall down, it's that every single day, more and more, as we do our devotion time or just spend time with the Lord, little branches go off the main roots. And they grow, and they grow, and they grow. And they, st they strengthen that tree as each of those other little tendrils go into the ground. And what he's calling us to is to be rooted in him in such a way that we just learn more about him every single day. I just want you to know me more as prophet, as priest, as king. I want you to know me more and more as Christ, as Jesus, as Lord of your life. The more you know about me, the more you are being rooted in me and secured in me. Last week at prayer meeting, I was sharing with Tony a word that I felt from the Lord for him. We just, we were, we were there praying. And just at the end of the meeting, we just said, do I have a volunteer? And Tony, you were great. I said, I'll volunteer. He had no idea what we were doing. And so... I just said, let's just come around him and encourage him today. We'll do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. And we came around, we just had words of encouragement, words that the Lord put on our hearts. And the word I had for you was tree. And it took us to Psalm chapter 1. And I want to read that for you because I think it ties in with this idea of being rooted in Christ. Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of mockers, but this is, these are the two verses that really hit home, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree 
planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. And I think the more that we are rooted in him, the more that we take time to understand who Christ is. No wonder Paul, up to this point, has just taken the entire time not to instruct them, but just to remind them or teach them or to encourage them to focus on Jesus. Because if you're not focused and rooted in him, nothing else matters. You can't move forward until your roots are secure. You can't, I mean, from an English point of view, that made no sense. But I understand, like, you need to be rooted in order to grow. And that's what Paul does. So he says, I want you to be rooted. How do I want you to be rooted? In Christ. So if that's true, I want you to be rooted in everything about Christ. I want you to be rooted in the person of Christ. I want you to be rooted in the character of Christ. I want you to be rooted in the understanding of Christ by, by the Holy Spirit to understand, okay, Christ is love. So I want to be rooted not only in Christ, I want to be rooted in love. And so from that, I want to be built up in love. And I want to not only be rooted and built up, I want to walk in love. Okay? So take any other attribute. I want to be rooted in truth. I want to be built up in truth. And I want to walk in truth. If Christ is the Prince of Peace, I want to be rooted in his peace. I want to be built up in his peace. And I want to walk in peace. Okay? Repetition's good. So I want to be rooted in faith. I want to be built up in faithfulness, and I want to walk in that faithfulness and faith. Right? You can do the same for any characteristic. Obedience. Purity. Right? For us, like, do I understand the purity, the holiness of Christ? I want to be, root, I want to be built up in the holiness of Christ so I can live a holy, pure life. That as people see me walking, not just being rooted in it, not just being built up in it, but actually doing something in the world. I want people to see the image of Christ in me. So whether it be love or truth or peace or faith or fullness or obedience or purity or holiness, I want that to be my image. You know, we all have an image, right? And, and sometimes for different people from their perspective, they just claim it, you with an image. But I want someone to be able to, like Paul, say there's no dispute about my image. My image is Jesus. And so it is that when you see me, you see Jesus. That's what it means to be a follower of Christ. So he's saying, I want you to be rooted in him. So that it's, there's just no dispute about who he is. So that you will have no dispute about how you, would, you are supposed to live in response. We even shared this morning, though. Uh, so who has modeled Jesus like this for you? Who has been so loving to you? Who has shared the truth of Christ with you? Who has been peaceful with you? And you know what? They could have gone the other way and made it very chaotic for you. Who has been faithful to you in prayer, in their walk? Even when you weren't very faithful, they were constantly faithful. Who is obedient to the Lord, even when everyone was swaying from that? Who is pure and holy? and was a model for you to walk by that you are thankful for today, could it be in the coming generations that that's you? That someone says that of you, as they did of Christine Kane. Christine, not Kane, Sinclair. Christine Kane doesn't play soccer, as far as I know. But not only rooted in love, he wants us to be built up in love. In 1 Corinthians 3, I want to read from that passage to understand this idea of being built up. And starting in verse 10, it says, By the grace God give, has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. And someone else is building on it, but each one should build with care. So we're talking about the building process. Not only should we be rooted, but we have a responsibility to be built up. And building on not any weak foundation, but making sure our foundation is secure. It's in Christ. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation using gold or silver or costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light, the day being judgment day, the day when Christ returns, and it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work, and if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. So essentially, everyone's responsible for their own work. 
So you're, this idea of being built up in him. And in Matthew chapter 7, very famous, of course, this idea of um, the wise and foolish builders, starting in verse 24, Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because its foundation was on the rock. And so it, so it is with our lives, and we know the opposite of what happens when it's not built on the rock. You've probably experienced it. That he wants us to be built on him, growing up in him. And I think of that idea, we've talked about uh, different times in our church, about the ideas of coming together, and um, we talk about having this, this work of the Spirit, being in tune with the Spirit, praying, just understanding supernaturally who Christ is. That's, that's one part. That's like being rooted in Christ. But then we had this part over here. It was called like, like a mentorship or uh, we talk about disciple making and working with one another here in the body. So the people that are in this room and upstairs, we get together on a regular basis, not only Sunday, but through the week, I hope. And there are times when we just encourage one another. There's this idea of being built up in one another. We model for one another. We come alongside. And sometimes we are the ones who are being mentored. And sometimes we are the ones who are mentoring. But we are building up one another in Christ. There's so many one another's. Love one another. Serve one another. Encourage one another. Admonish one another. Teach one another. Like all the one another's. Let's do those one another's so that we can be built up with the foundation of Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. That's why it's so important, not just Sunday morning, but every day or through the week for us to get together. So if I can just put a little sidebar comment here is if you're not getting together with other people in this faithful community during the week, then you're missing out on the opportunity to be built up. And we've had opportunities. So whether it's you know, a Saturday morning men's group, or whether it's a, a, a women's Bible study, or whether it's a discipleship class, or whether it's a small group or life group or community group, whatever you want to call it. But those are opportunities, a prayer time. Like, what is it? Like, we came together at our house on Sunday night. What a beautiful time to just pray together. Like, we were being built up in one another and encouraged. That's why we come together on Sunday morning, to be built up and encouraged by one another. We come and celebrate together. And remember who Christ is. That's what God is calling us to. So not only be rooted in him, but built up in him. So, so far, we've done nothing outside. We've done everything to this point of just being rooted in him in our daily walk, rooting in him on Sunday morning, just understanding who Christ is, and then being built up in the body, all the one another's, encouraged, built, served one another. And then, and then, now though, he's saying, but it doesn't stop there. It goes down deep. It goes up nice and high. But you also have to go out. And there is a time when we have to move, and that's being on mission. And it's this idea of walking or living in love, depending on the translation, you'll see like walk in Christ or live in Christ, to live it out, to walk it out every single day. And he says this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, catch this. By this we may know we are in Christ. Whoever says Christ abides in him or her ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. He calls us to walk. And the walking happens in the world. And it happens in our everyday life. School, play, work, so on. How is it that we're walking? So he calls us to be a person of Christ, rooted, you know, rooted in the understanding that I, like, just like Christine felt this love for soccer, we have a very different love. It's Christ. She was built up and worked with a team on the Canadian team in soccer. But we don't work... For soccer, we work for Christ. We want to be built up in Christ to understand what does it be, is it to be more like Christ? How can I be encouraged to understand and do the things of Christ? But not only that, they don't just go to practice. They get out on the field and they play. And now it's time for us to go and move. And so it says walk just in the same way in which he walked. He said, John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. He walks. We walk with him. 1 Peter 2, verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He mentored us so that we would then go and walk in the steps that he walked. And so we are to walk. I, I want to just draw us to a couple of other passages. They're both in Colossians, so it's not far to turn. In Colossians chapters 3 and 4, this, these are just encouragements for us to think of how is it that we should walk. If you'll bear with me, I just want to read some scripture to you. Colossians 3, verses 9 to 17. Mm -hmm. I'm going to push it away for me. Okay. 
Uh, I think it's five. That's why I was questioning. Yeah, I put down the wrong number. All right. Um, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, starting verse five. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways. So this is the mentoring, modeling. This is the, I'm now rooted in Christ. I'm now being built up. So some of the things I used to do, I now lo no longer do. I, I get sharpened uh, with, when I'm in connection with other believers. I get honed. I get sandpapered. I get hugged. I get, you know, like all these things. It's like challenge and encouragement. So you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all these such things, anger and rage and malice and slander and filthy language. Why? Because of the law? No, because you're not expressing the image of Christ. Do you understand? Some people want to do these, this list because they think, oh, if I just do this list, then that'll make me accepted. No, Christ accepted you. <laughs> he is your eternal savior, okay? But he's asking you to be like him. And so you can't be like him when you are angry and full of rage and malice and slander and filthy language and gossip and all those things. You just can't represent him. Don't lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here, there... Here there is no Gentile or Jew. There's no uncircumcised or uncircumcised. There's no barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. That's what he's talking about. Christ living in us and us in him. Therefore, let's do what we should be doing. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with, does anyone know these? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. This isn't an exhaustive list, but these are words that we can use to describe Christ, right? Can, can you really, is it too much of a task to ask you to be compassionate? You know what? On our own human strength, sometimes it is hard, but in Christ, it's natural. What about being kind or humble or gentle or patient? So you're thinking patience, that is only from the Spirit, right? But he wants to work in us in a way that we bear with each other and forgive each other. If anyone has a grievance against us, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Be thankful. But it says in verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, this is a pretty good summary statement, whatever you do, Word or deed? Do it all in the name of the Lord. The Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. I mean, it goes on. It talks about being devoted to prayer. It talks about proclaiming the mystery of the gospel, going out. Make the most of every opportunity, it says later in chapter 4, verse 6. It says, let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I think when we do those things, we become the walking image, the talking image of Christ. So we're rooted in him, we're built up in him, and we walk in him. I was reading, or listening actually, to a podcast this week of the three purposes. Someone believed he's a long-standing pastor, and on this podcast he was saying the three purposes that we share with our church every week of why we meet on Sunday morning. Number one is we celebrate. We celebrate who Christ is. Number two, number two. We challenge. We challenge the people to be built up. And we know that when you're built up, some of that takes a lot of work. Being a teammate, going through practice, takes a lot of energy and a lot of work. Sometimes the practices are harder than the actual game. Like, it's just, there are things that go on behind the scenes. We need to be encouraged and built up. And the third, he said, is not only celebrate, not only challenge the people through the word, but we connect. And our goal is to connect people, connect people not only here in this room, but beyond this room so that people will understand what it means to walk, us to connect with the world around us. So for us, could it be that we would celebrate Christ, that we would be so rooted in Christ that we can do nothing but celebrate him? That we would then get into the word and with one another, we understand what it means to be challenged in our understanding, let's be really honest. If I was pointing out to all of you, like on a scale of one to 10, where would your spiritual knowledge be? On a scale of one to 10, where would your hunger for the word be? 
Where would, where would your understanding of how it is to share the gospel? Do you know how to share it? Like, if I asked you this morning, I won't. But if I asked you, honestly, being honest in your own heart, would you know how to share the gospel with someone? Would you know? Would you actually know the story of Christ well enough? Would you know Christ well enough or the story of Christ well enough and what he wants you to share with other people well enough behind the scenes that you could actually walk out in your daily walk and share it with anyone at a moment's notice as it calls us to be ready in season and out of season? Could you do that? If not, then why don't you take the safe space to come and to learn about how it is you could share your faith? Maybe it is that you could get into the Word. Maybe you go, you know, I don't even understand what this says. I have a great Bible, and even with the extra words on the bottom, I, I just still don't grasp this. Could it be that there's someone before you or with you, beside you, maybe even someone younger than you, who understands it in a way that you don't and could come alongside you and mentor you? Let's get mentored. And a way to be encouraged so that we can go out and we can connect with other people with the good news of the gospel. At the beginning of the year, 2023, I felt three words that God gave us. Not only are we to be, as, as we've been talking about this morning, celebrating Christ and, and, and challenged or encouraged in Christ, but then to go and connect with people about Christ, I felt like God had given us these three words, and I feel like they line up. Can we understand his presence? Remember this? Presence? We just stand in his presence, understand who Christ is. Stand in the presence of God and just understand just how amazing he is. And from that, the next word was partnership. We partner with one another in the church. We come alongside each other. We partner with one another and, and just iron sharpening iron. And we just love on one another, encourage one another, serve one another so we can understand how it is that we can be equipped to go and say yes to whatever Christ has for us in the world. The three words were, were presence and partnership and yes. And there are so many things that he is wanting us to say yes to in the world, but we will never say yes. We will never say yes until we understand who he is. And when we're built up in him, rooted in him, and built in him, built up in him so that we can live for him in the world around us. That's the challenge that Paul had for the church. And I think it's a good summary of Paul's instruction to us that we would have this idea of presence and partnership and yes, that we would have this idea of celebration and challenge and connection. That we would have this understanding of being rooted and built up and walking and living in Christ. That we would say, I want to be a good person. I want to be holy. I want to align. I want to be the image of Christ who is so good as a person. And I want to be, come alongside him. I want to be a teammate with Christ in his church because he loves the church and he knows that's where we can grow and learn together but I want to be a player. I don't want to sit on the bench. I want to get out on the field. I want to do the thing that he's called me to do. I just want to say yes. The moment coach says in, I want to say yes. I'll be, whatever position, whatever place, whatever time, I just say yes. And so this, that's where I'm stopping by the way. I, I just, I feel like that's for us. Could it be that we would just have such a hunger to be rooted in him? And could we just humble ourselves enough to say we don't know it all, know that we need to be built up in him with the encouragement of those who are around us. And that we would have even bolder audacity and capacity to say I'm willing to now step out in faith and say yes to whatever he's calling me to. I don't know if that's a neighbor. I don't know if that's a classmate. I don't know if that's a family member. I don't know if that's a stranger. I don't know if it's here in Nova Scotia or halfway around the world. I have no idea, but are you willing to say yes? And so I think it is a good reminder for us about valuing his presence, partnering with Christ in his church, that we would go on mission and say yes. Okay, that's what I got. And I hope it's an encouragement to you, and I hope that as you read Colossians and other works of Paul, a guy who was in prison for Christ and was living to say to live as Christ and to die as gain, that we have a great living example of hope dead now, but it seems to be living. It just seems like he's talking to me when he writes this. 2,000 years ago, and it's still vibrant. I hope it's encouraging to you and to me that we would walk it out. So let me just pray. And, um, I'm going to invite Martin, I think, to come back and share another song. So let, let's just pray. God, you're doing a work here. Um, it's simple. It's two verses, it seems, but so full of what it is that you're calling us to. And I pray that, that we would just long to know you more. That we would long to be rooted in you, that our branches would be filled with fruit because of where we're planted in you. And that we would serve the world around us.
by the love that you've shown us, that we've experienced. We thank you for loving us first on the cross, giving your life for us, that we could give our lives to you. Jesus, we just want to say yes. Help us to know what you're asking, that we'd be confident to do that. Yes, yes, yes. In Jesus' name, amen.